Hello, my name is Julia Schnabel. I'm a professor of computational imaging at King's College London, and I'm very pleased to be speaking at this year's MIUA, which was to be held in Oxford, which is now in a virtual event. I'm going to talk about smart medical imaging, going from medical image acquisition to analysis and understanding. First of all, he's, these are my disclosures. I would like to acknowledge the fund, funding uh, support we have received. In this talk, I'm going to look a little bit at uh, machine and deep learning approaches in particular, which in medical imaging have shown great promise in image segmentation in disease detection and classification and prediction tasks. However, their success is quite limited by the quality of the images that are used during training and testing. And this is why these uh, algorithms quite often failed once applied to uh, real clinical data because we often have trained only on really well curated high quality training data from volunteers. So in this work we want to apply deep learning to address some of these challenges. In particular we focus on artifact detection and artifact removal using suitable realistic data augmentation methods and we also work on image fusion for larger field of view imaging. We show how these methods then can help in further downstream tasks such as image segmentation. We illustrate this by two examples, one being cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, where we focus on quality control, on image reconstruction and cardiac segmentation. And the second example is fetal or maternal ultrasound imaging, where we look at whole placenta imaging. To apply machine learning and medical imaging, you need a lot of data. Um, we, uh, once we have that, we can actually train neural networks for simple tasks. For example, here is a simple classification or regression network, which can be used also for detection. Uh, this is an encoder decoder architecture, which is very popular for image segmentation, but it can also be used for reconstruction uh, or denoising. In fact, because we're here looking at cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, we can also look directly at the case based data from the sensor and train networks to um, infer knowledge directly. So, in the following, I'm going to report some of our cardiac MR work as part of our Smart Heart grant, which is a collaborative effort. And we're working on UK Biobank data, which gives us a really nice, well curated uh, database, which we then can adapt to um, make our algorithms fit for uh, clinical practice. Our first application is classification, looking at good and poor quality data. And as I've mentioned before, you can use a very simple encoder architecture for this. This in real images would amount to classifying an image of containing a dog or a cat. Here we are interested in, in the classifying images into good or poor quality. Our first application um, applies to incorrect scan planning. In order to um, acquire a really nice four chamber view of the heart as shown on the right, we need to acquire very carefully two chamber and short axis images as shown here. You need to apply an appropriate angle to on the short axis view and you need to be careful to exclude the aorta. If this is done incorrectly, this results in so-called off axis images as shown here. Here you see the presence of the left ventricular outflow tract, the LVOT, which gives this four chamber view a five chamber look, which then poses difficulties in further atrial analysis. So to address this problem, we um, feed the network a training data set of good quality data, but also poor um, LVOT um, containing uh, quality data and train the network to um, classify the Im input images as either containing the LVOT or not, so being poor quality or bad quality. We adopt a very simple so-called convolutional neural ne network, which is similar to the original LUNET, um, which consists of a number of pooling layers and downsampling layers and a final fully connected layer and classification output. 
as data, we used 123 good quality images from UK Biobank. In fact, we could have used thousands and thousands of more good quality images because it's so nicely curated. But we also find 123 LVRT images contained in UK Biobank, despite the good quality control of that, of that database. And we applied normal data augmentation to these. So we did rotation and translation of the input images to generate more jitter and um, more samples. We also used five temporal frames of each sequence, so that gave us 615 images for each class. We applied stratified tenfold cross-validation to make more thorough testing. Here on this table, you see our results. We started off with very simple, classic machine learning methods, such as k-nearest neighbors, linear support vector machines, random forest, other boosts, and so forth. And then we applied also the convolution neural network without data augmentation and with data augmentation. And as you can see, uh, the accuracy increases for those methods. And we also get higher precision and recall. We were also interested to see what the network actually learns. This is a, a zoom in region where the LVRT is present in the four chamber view. And this is a good quality image. If we look at the attention map of the network, we see that the focus of the network is for the LVRT image, the poor quality image, directly at the position where the LVRT is present. Whereas in the good quality attention map, it just is there at the separation of the heart chambers. That gave us a little bit of reassurance that the network is focusing on the right areas when training. The second example I want to show you here is image reconstruction. As I've showed you before, you can use simple encoder decoder architectures to convert poor quality into good quality images. Here it's shown in the, in the spatial domain and that's, and that's called denoising or image restoration. What you need there is good data pairs of good and, and poor quality images. And then once you show poor quality images to the network, it would automatically convert it to a higher quality version of itself. We there actually decided to not do this in the spatial domain because a lot of the quality corruption happens directly at time of image acquisition during case space. And we adopted a method by Zhu et al, which was published in Nature in 2018, which does such an approach. It's a 2D um, convolutional neural network, which takes as an input the complex image data, the case space, uh, has a couple of fully connected layers, making it computationally quite complex, uh, does convolution layers, and finally deconvolution. Basically, this network is learning in the ideal case, the inverse Fourier transform to go from the frequency domain to the spatial domain. It was designed for undersampled data, um, but we, we actually are interested in fully sampled but co corrupted data. So by adopting it, we have looked at a lot of good quality and motion artifact containing images from UK Biobank. We picked uh, from three, three and a half thousand subjects, we found 105 subjects which had a motion artifact, which is much lower than what you would get in clinical practice. Uh, and these motion artifacts are due to arrhythmia, to breathing and mistriggering. In particular, the motion artifact shown here on the right shows a bit of a motion blur through the cardiac phases, which indicates that the ECG triggering has been wrong. As we only have 104, 105 subjects with this particular motion artifact, we have again a severe class imbalance problem, which then requires some more realistic data augmentation. As this is an artifact which happens during case-based acquisition, we do this uh, um, data augmentation again in case space, which is where the problem occurs. So when you acquire cardiac images over the cardiac cycle, you start filling case space across the different phases between the different ECG triggers. So not a single temporal frame is acquired at one time point, but over several um, instances over several cardiac cycles. Um, if you see here, frame I, you get a frame I case space, and a frame N, you get the frame N case space. But if you've got a corrupt frame, as shown on the right, what happens that frame I uh, is interleaved with uh, case space acquisitions, which actually belong to a different frame, and it's called frame J. So we've got the frame I plus J offset. So you have a perturbation in directly in the case space. This is a Cartesian sampling scheme. 
if you would then know the inverse Fourier transform, you get the corrupted frame I and you can compare to the frame I and see the difference. This is an absolutely realistic simulation of this particular uh, motion artifact because this is what ECG triggering would look like. So what that allows us to do, to take any of the 3,400 uh, good quality images of UK Biobank, go into K-space, basically into the Fourier domain, and perturb uh, the K-space lines across the respective cardiac cycles. So here you see going from a high quality image to a poor quality image, which looks really realistic because uh, you see the motion blur through the cardiac phases, as you might see in the clinic. In a way, this is the same as doing data augmentation, say an image net when wriggling around a cat. But here we're trying to use a more physics um, motivated model. So we adopted the automap method by Zhu et al., uh, where, which originally takes as an input an undersampled complex case space, learns basically the inverse transformation, and as an output gets a reconstructed high resolution image. However, in our case, our input is not an undersampled complex space, case space. In our case, the input is a corrupted complex case space. It's fully sampled, and our output should be then an artifact corrected image. We added, in fact, a bit of a discriminator to that to make this network a bit more robust uh, and applied it to our task. So here you see uh, the original image on the right. Uh, the corrupted case space on the left. Uh, if you would just do an inverse Fourier transform, you would get uh, the column B, the Fourier um, image, uh, and our proposed method is shown in column C. Now, while it looks a little bit more blurry than the Fourier transformed image, we can also see it is a bit more faithful representation of the underlying cardiac anatomy. So you actually see the image at the correct cardiac phase and not at almost a different phase as you would see in column B. We also applied our method to a real corrupted case where we do not have the ground truth. We do not know how the original image would have looked like if the uh, case baselines had been correctly binned. So this is the case base, this is the inverse Fourier transform, and this is our proposed method. And you can actually see that there is a substantial improvement of our method. You see the papillary muscles much more clearly, a better definition of the myocardia, and so forth. So you, if you improve the image quality, you often do that for purpose. Um, you would want to have either better diagnostic quality of the images, or you actually want to extract other information from those images. And one quite uh, meaningful piece of information is cardiac, segment, cardiac segmentation, the volume of the left ventricle, for example. So we can train networks to do segmentation as shown here. So it's again an encoder decoder um, architecture, which could be, um, for example, the famous unit by Olaf Ronneberger. Um, but if we've got really nice images, uh, that works quite well. As you see here, the original image on the right, original segmentation, just applying unit or similar segmentation method. We actually apply the one by Wen Jai Bai here. Um, but if we corrupt the image, you know, and have a realistic corruption, uh, our segmentation methods would fail currently. So low quality images lead to low quality segmentation. That's why they're quite often excluded from training. But on the other hand, this is what we see in clinical practice. We might still want to segment those. This is a bit overlooked in the segmentation literature. So we decided to address this really important issue. So here you see, um, again, on the left, the original good quality image, the original segmentation. Uh, then you see, again, the corrupted image and how the segmentation fails. Um, we applied to then uh, another method called Win5 by Peng et al. for um, improving the quality of the image. Uh, there is a, a slight improvement, as you might discern. And you see that the segmentation improves a little bit after applying that um, artifact correction. But when applying our proposed artifact correction, our segmentation actually looks really quite good. It is not perfect. It's not exactly the same as you see on the left, but it's certainly useful information. Here are the results backing up uh, our method. So we, we compared our method to several um, 
artifact correction methods, for example, case-based deep learning, convolution autoencoders, a deep residual network, and a wide inference network, as we've just shown on the previous slide, in fact. You also see on the bottom our proposed method uh, using two different kinds of loss functions. And you see that the dice coefficient uh, for the cardiac segmentation improves uh, with our uh, final proposed method, which actually does not only use the mean squared error, but it also uses the structural similarity index measure as well. We also get a uh, better MCD and Hausdorff distance. So our next idea was to think about knowing that we know how the artifact actually appears by displacing case baselines, we actually might want to detect those case baselines and discard them from um, the reconstruction. So we could con uh, convert our artifact correction problem into an Im image acceleration problem because in, if you apply under sampling, uh, for reconstruction, you accelerate imaging. And there are a lot of examples like, uh, like the one shown here, where you apply an undersampling trajectory during image acquisition. You get an undersampled case space, you get an undersampled image, but you apply a reconstruction network in combination with a data consistency network and get a high quality reconstruction. Uh, there's a whole literature on that, on getting better reconstruction from undersampled data. In our case, of course, we want to address the problem of image artifacts. So we've got a fully sampled acquisition, so a fully sampled um, uh, trajectory for our case space, but some of the lines are just plainly wrong. So we know that the case space has displaced placed lines, and there we can apply now a detection network, which actually learns which of those lines are wrong. We know from our um, augmented training data, because we have applied the displacement of the case baselines, we actually know the ground truth for those data. Or we would get an artifact image directly um, after um, uh, transforming it back to the spatial domain. Our reconstruction network actually can help the task by applying a data consistency term in addition to that, which gives us then a high quality reconstruction. This is how the network works. We actually uh, use as an input uh, the uh, 3D input, the 2D plus time corrupted case space sequence, and we use a recurrent neural network approach, which uh, uh, makes use of the redundancy in the temporal dimension. We apply our data consistency term after um, the, the detection network, and we get a nice 2D plus time corrected output sequence. So our loss function consists of a detection loss and a reconstruction loss as shown here. We again used UK Biobank for this. We used 200 2D plus time images for training, 50 2D plus time images for validation and 2D, 50 2D plus time images for testing. Um, you see here a good quality image, a good quality case space, and one of our corrupted images and the corrupted case space. These are from our input data for training. And then we can actually apply uh, the validation. We again applied, uh, uh, performed the comparison to two methods, to the deep residual network and the wide inference networks, which performed quite well. And in our case, we now have this uh, proposed uh, solution the, where we, uh, with uh, PSNR, RMSE, and structural similarity index measure outperform all the other methods. We even compare it to our previous automap GAN method, which we outperform. Our upper bound would be if we would actually know what the mask is. And of course, we can generate uh, artificially some testing data where we know what the ground truth is. Uh, and if you would just apply that mask rather than detecting it, you see that we can't find much more improvement there. On the right, we actually also um, use as input data uncorrupted images, where we actually assume that probably none of the case baselines have been swapped. Um, we would not know if, if there were, uh, but we find that we also find really good measurements better than for the other methods for the PSNR, RSM, RMSE, and SSM which indicates that we could use this network, this end-to-end -end network, uh, also just for normal image reconstruction, even if the data is of high quality. 
Here are just some examples. You see a corrupted image on the left, the reconstruction uh, next to it, the ground truth, um, and a difference image. We compare just two methods. The upper row is our previous automap gun method, and the bottom one is our proposed method. But you see it has a higher PSNR and you see a lower difference features. We've recently taken this to the next step and um, extended our network to also perform segmentation. So basically going from corrupted case space directly to the segmentation. The intermediate steps still perform the reconstruction, the data consistency, the artifact detection, and then finally the segmentation, but these are all feeding into one single loss function with a combined training objective. This is quite exciting work because it opens up the avenue for finding more and more end-to-end -end solutions for poor quality data and um, other clinical measures you might want to extract at the end of this network. This concludes the first part of this talk. In the second part, I want to talk about fetal and maternal ultrasound imaging. This is part of our iFind grant, which is again a collaborative um, effort. If you want to image the placenta or the fetus uh, at late gestation, the problem is that you've got a very limited field of view. To um, accommodate for that, we designed um, a 3D printed holder for several ultrasound probes. So you can actually simultaneously image um, the fetus from different angles. We know the, the relative um, positioning of the probes, we can calibrate for that and we can infuse the images. This is all be, um, enabled by using a multiplexer in the ultrasound and we can attach up to four probes to the ultrasound machine. It's actually quite a comfortable operation for the expecting mother um, and we get really nice 4D, 3D plus time image streams from that. Here you see what happens if you wanted to image the uh, placenta and anterior position from three different angles, you only get a partial view. However, if you fuse those views with using three probes rather than just a single one, you get a multi-probe view and a whole placenta view. You see a manual placenta segmentation. So we can actually train networks using either single view placenta segmentations or the multi uh, view placenta segmentations. For example, you see uh, uh, the famous UNET again, an encoder decoder architecture. And we tried different methods. We tried uh, just using the individual views, uh, getting individual segmentations and then fusing the segmentation outcome. Uh, we used the, the fused view, trained networks on that and get a fused outcome automatically and then we did actually a combination of both single view and multi-view to a joint training to get a joint output. As data we used 127 3D ultrasound images which were selected from 4D 3D plus time image streams from 30 patients. You see the distribution of the gestational ages of the fetus on the right. So this was at the late second and even the fairly mid-stage third uh, trimester. We used several two probe images and three probe images and did various experiments on the segmentation accuracy and also we compared to MRI of the placenta. And here on the bottom, you see a slice to the 3D ultrasound image for two different patients. You see the, the difficulty in the views and the difference in shape and appearance uh, of the placenta. Browsing through the 3D volumes. Here is the second trimester uh, placenta position and uh, posterior position. This is easier to get one single view because it's further away from the prop. Uh, but here you see the, uh, the fused view. You get a really nice uh, multi-view image. Here you see the segmentation. So you would actually just capture it with one single view. However, if you've got an anterior placenta as shown here, you only get partial views. So the multi-view image actually really helps in the image acquisition and in the subsequent uh, segmentation. Here we show some results on the segmentation accuracy measured using the dice coefficient and relative volume differences. And you see that the multi-view, um, uh, combined multi-view result uh, 
uh, or S3 gives really good results. The single view result is still a little bit better by fusing the results, which is actually promising because multiplexes and multi-view images would not normally be available. But remember here we have still three single views from the placenta or two single views from the placenta merged. So any of those approaches actually are really quite helpful because with a single view only you would not be able to segment by merging several single views either by performing individual segmentations and then fusing the result or by directly training on multi-view images gives you some really good results. The reason why the uh, straightforward multi-view segmentation as two did not work so well because we had just had fewer training data. We only had 30 data sets there. What we also did, we compared the placental volume uh, segmentation from ultrasound, both manual um, by our sonographers and our automatic methods with a manual segmentation obtained from MRI. So you see on the bottom fetal ultrasound, a two probe view and fetal MRI um, on the right. You see the, uh, uh, here the manual segmentations, the overlap then of the um, fetal ultrasound segmentation onto the MRI just by using very simple rigid um, reorientation. And then you can also put the ultrasound volume into the MRI. There's no registration really applied. It's a manual um, process. What you can see is a high volume agreement between the um, um, placenta extracted from MRI and from ultrasound. It was backed up by the numbers on the previous slide, um, but here you also can see um, in red the um, placenta extracted from MRI and in yellow extracted from ultrasound. You see a really nice um, uh, agreement of the volume. So we can with ultrasound extract quite accurate volumes of the placenta. We don't need to use MRI for that. I want to conclude this talk by giving some future perspectives on smart medical imaging. I think there is a whole uh, range of uh, research to be done in quality control for active imaging. Active imaging means that at the time of acquisition, you decide what kind of images you need to acquire for optimal results. This could be real-time decisions in MRI on which and how many case baselines you need to acquire or need to reacquire or it could be real-time multi-view fusion of ultrasound scans, as I've just shown. There's also a lot of margin for end-to-end -end learning methods where we can infer accurate clinical measurements, such as placental volume or myocardial volume, but also going a bit further, directly from corrupted or imperfect raw image data. It could also mean inferring 3D measurements from 2D ultrasound planes in real time, given enough training data. I'd like to acknowledge all the researchers who have contributed uh, to these two projects. And I want to use this as a mini plug to advertise our new free open access journal called MELBA, which has been launched this July. Uh, please consider uh, submitting your MIUA ver journal versions to our journal. It costs $10 submission fee and it's free open access otherwise, and you retain your copyright. If you fancy a real conference in 2021, I hope to see you in Braunholm next summer uh, in Rönne um, for IPMI. And I'd like to thank my former group, which includes the organizers of this conference for inviting me to this workshop. And I very much hope that we can see each other for real at MIA 2020 uh, next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>